YouTube has strict community guidelines over what we can and cannot say about COVID-19 vaccines and treatments. If YouTube deems we've somehow violated these guidelines, we risk YouTube cutting off our ability to communicate to you. With that said, the discussions which follow are not meant to provide medical advice. Please seek the advice of local health officials for any COVID-19 and or COVID vaccine related questions and concerns. Today, the FDA is likely to authorize emergency use authorization for children to get the COVID vaccine. And when I say children, I mean babies. Uh, also, an explosive new study on lockdowns and the ADL changes the definition of racism. We've got all that and more coming up and it all starts right now. Welcome to the News and Why It Matters. I am Sarah Gonzalez, and uh, I just have to say, I love a day when I am just completely, like, outbrained on my own program, which I will be today because I have uh, two very amazing guests to introduce you to. One is in studio. We have James Lindsay, who is the author of Race Marxism and the founder of New Discourse. And uh, we also have investigative journalist Jordan Schachtel joining us remotely. I'm so glad that both of you are, are on at the same time. I feel like you guys, actually, when I, I when I talked to James uh, off air, I was like, "Do you, have you do you know Jordan? Have you met him? Because I feel like you guys would get along." And I heard you guys have not actually met yet in person. So, uh, but we're glad to have you here on the same program together, um, Jordan. I want to give you a chance to instead of me trying to explain your own piece that you wrote at your Substack, uh, I want to just allow you the opportunity to explain to people what is going on. So, Jordan wrote a piece. It is called the the shell game continues. Moderna's FDA-approved vax is not available to Americans, and it's not scrutinized for Omicron. Uh, you've written about this before, but um, I, I want you to explain to America what it is that's going on. So basically, thanks for having me on. So basically, there are two now FDA-approved vaccines. One is named Comirnaty, that is was developed by Pfizer. The other is named Spikevax, and that was made by Moderna. The Moderna one was approved yesterday. What these things have in common is that both of these vaccines are actually not available to any Americans at all. And it simply seems to be an information operation that's running um, in with these uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies and big government, uh, specifically government health. They are, believe it or not, they are giving FDA approval to two products that currently do not exist in the United States. And there's a lot of reasons uh, why that's going on. Um, and, you know, I'll leave that to legal experts. But the, the fact of the matter is that they are not available. Mm. Uh, James, I recall I was at a an event with you and we were both speaking there and I recall a woman during the question and answer session come forward and start asking questions uh, to the liberal on our panel why he was talking about a vaccine that had not been approved. It's not been approved in the United States. The vaccine that we have right now has not been approved and everyone made her out to sound like she was crazy and uh, she was a lunatic and they didn't answer her question. But then you read the work that Jordan is doing and a couple other people have been uncovering and it's like, Guys, she's not wrong. <laughs> we're not the crazy ones here. No, we're not the crazy ones. They, the shell game is is, is really mysterious. Uh, you know, like like Jordan said, we can ask the legal experts why they're doing this. But there are two different types of vaccines, uh, and I don't mean Moderna versus Pfizer. I mean there are ones that are FDA approved that are actually not available, and then there are the ones that have emergency use authorization, mm -hmm. and those are the ones that are actually being given. The claim is that they're probably maybe close to chemically identical or right. the ingredients are the same or something of this nature but technically they are legally distinct products and the lady's not crazy they mm -hmm. they are actually using the emergency use while promoting through the media this idea that it's actually FDA approved so your average person is going to believe that they're taking an FB, FDA approved product when in reality they're taking the emergency use authorization product that of course has total legal 
immunity under right. emergency use uh, rather than the thing that the FDA has actually approved. And so the fact of the matter is, is that they are playing this game where they want the perception to be that the product is safer and more approved than it is. Uh, and the reasons why are, are anyone's guess, but mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like there's a not nefarious explanation for this. Right. Uh, Jordan, where are you finding this information? Obviously, they're trying, as James mentioned, they're, the perception is supposed to be that this is all the same thing and there's nothing to see here. So where are you finding this information and why do we not have a mainstream media that is finding this information if it's available to you? Yeah, a lot of it has to be done through just open source research. I mean, as you guys are well aware of, these these technological uh, giants, big tech, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, they are censoring and deplatforming a lot of people who have been trying to talk about this in the past. And, you know, I think we all can just assume our days are numbered on those platforms. But it, it, it's very shocking to see the, the corporate press they're full steam ahead with this campaign, as, as James very well described the distinction between the EUA and the FDA approved vaccines. If you read the corporate press, if you live in like New York, DC, San Francisco, LA, you will have no idea that there is a distinction between the two. You just read the, what is essentially a big form of press release from like Reuters or one of these other big wire services that says it's approved but it really hasn't been approved at all. That's not the story. The story is that there is a legally distinct version. That version has been approved and that version is not publicly available. And these pharmaceutical companies are now saying that you know, they don't plan on producing this stuff in the United States. Um, it, it's very easy to fact check this stuff. You know, anyone can go to their local doctor's office or their pharmacy and ask for the FDA approved version spike vax or comirnaty and i guarantee you that they will tell you that it is not in stock because it has never been delivered yeah uh jordan what took you down this route because it's not um it just certainly doesn't earn you any friends in the mainstream media to do the work that you've been doing which i i think james would agree with me is such valuable work right now. I know you've been on the vaccine stuff. You've been on just generally uh, the COVID-19 uh, misperceptions throughout this all. So like, what, what was your spark that went, you know what, something's not right here and I'm going to follow it? So I have a background in international affairs. It's where my education is and where my previous work lies. So I was kind of monitoring this stuff really early on with all the craziness that was going on in Wuhan. And then I was seeing that the narratives were not aligning with the actual facts and what was going on on the ground. And there was all this weird stuff going on um, between governments, between pharmaceutical companies. And there seemed to be like this cartel effect that I was pretty familiar with. So I just kind of started there and have been reporting on it since. But, you know, I think the good news is that, um, you know, at least early on, we had like no support at all for um, our very rational perspectives on this madness. But I think that a lot of people are coming around. I think that's definitely exhibited by you see a lot of Europe um, getting rid of this like vaccine passport regime. You see this these trucker rallies everywhere in the world that were started in Canada. And I, I think there's a lot of reasons for optimism that we didn't see at all in most of 2021. Yeah, James, do you agree with uh, the, the optimism? Yeah, actually, <clears throat> you wouldn't think so. But it, people have caught on very quickly. Something is amiss. People are noticing that something is amiss. It feels very much like a dam breaking. Mm -hmm. It feels like the facts have been withheld. And for a long time, things were scary. People didn't know. People didn't want to upset the, the, the cart too much. And now everybody seems to be asking questions, the things that, that were... Uh, not obvious are becoming more and more obvious and and the questions are coming out and then people are wondering you know okay so this thing is a thing that's happening it should be a huge scandal it's not even shocking it, so which means that people generally now believe that they're always lying to us about these things and if we're in that kind of a condition then you know there's nothing to have but optimism if if people are are already skeptical of, of, of whatever official narratives are being put out. So yeah, I see that, that this has changed very dramatically in the course of a year. I've, I'm cautiously optimistic, mm -hmm. I would say, but um, people, are, people are suspicious of, of everything that's going on to a degree that's 
not conducive to just sliding kind of tyranny onto people or whatever. Right, yeah, um, Jordan, I, I can say now proudly, I used to have to keep it a secret, but I can say now proudly I am uh, an, an OG of being anti-vax before it was cool, right? And um, so I felt like the silver lining in all of this is sort of at least people are waking up to the game that is being played by the FDA and the CDC. These are not new things. These are not new tactics that they're using, but at least maybe people, this will be the light bulb moment for a lot of people who previously just bought hook, line, and sinker everything that they said. What do you think? Yeah, it, it, it's an eye-opening moment. And uh, I, I think this will most certainly backfire on this cartel industry. I, I think more people are asking more questions than ever about you know what's going on with these pharmaceutical companies. Um, how long have they been doing this? And there's a lot of people that have been fighting this fight for a long time that have sadly been labeled as lunatics when I think that's totally, uh, you know, even maybe some of us on this team now um, may have labeled them as such and regret it. I, I mean, I, I remember just looking at like, you know, some of even uh, Robert Kennedy Jr.'s work and thinking like, oh, th yeah, this guy's crazy. You know, what is he? Why is he suing these pharmaceutical companies? And now I'm thinking like, oh, maybe, I mean, I'm not, I'm not certainly in agreement with everything he has to say, but I think there's, there's a lot of people, the contrarians out there, who have been trying to raise the alarm about this deep-seated corruption and um, you know this grifting and ridiculousness going on with these extremely powerful interests <laughs> at, that we've kind of just been ignoring or even thinking that they were on our side for a while. I, I think that a lot of us prior to this COVID mania thing would say that, oh, a company like Pfizer, I'm sure they're creating some life-saving medicines out there. And now you think of Pfizer and you're like, okay, um, they're creating products that might not be working and might actually be harming people uh, in the long run. And it, it's just night and day, the difference uh, between, you know, pre-2019 and what's going on right now. Yeah. James, you agree? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, it's it's really, really quick how, how people have caught on. And, and, and the lack of trust in these kinds of products, like Jordan was just saying, yeah. if you look at Pfizer and you think, I don't trust Pfizer, mm -hmm. you know, it, it makes it that much harder for them to, to force another round. Like maybe they come out with some new vaccine. Oh, this one solves all the problems. Everybody has to take it. And we, our memories aren't that short. Yeah. We, yeah. Yeah. We like, just went through this. Yeah. By the 10th booster, you're like, hold <laughs> on a second. You told me it was just going to be the double dose and I was done, and now I'm on my 10th booster. Something is amiss. Something is wrong. And what, people, what, what it all comes down to eventually is that people will say no. Yeah. If they trust, then they'll go along with. And if they have big reasons to not trust, then they're, they'll be more likely to say no. And that's ultimately what grinds this monster to a stop is people saying no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, Jordan, I want you to tell me. I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. Tell me. Before we have to go to break, what was your, in all of your research, you've done a lot of research in a lot of different aspects of this, what was like to you the most shocking or just grossest thing that you uncovered and you were like, I, I can't believe, I cannot believe the government would do that. And I realize it's a loaded question because I realize we're all in agreement that like we expect the government to just be complete pieces of garbage. So, but <laughs> even so, what do you think was like the, the most shocking, egregious thing that, that you found? Yeah, when, when it comes to the government and these pharmaceutical companies that they are willing, they, they know they have better data. They have even data that might show that their products that they're endorsing are harming people, but they'd rather lie and continue with this massive sunk cost. And at, at one point, you know, it becomes like an international uh, you know, humanitarian catastrophe. And I think we are slowly approaching that level. And, and yeah, I guess that's the one thing that I just remain totally shocked by is that the level to which these individuals and powerful organizations will go to lie to people, to one, bolster their profits and protect themselves from any legitimate criticism. If you remember Fauci, when he, uh, in the last Senate hearing with Rand Paul, he started going nuts about, oh, I, you know, I get death threats when Rand Paul was trying to uh, interrogate him a little bit. And it's just like totally insane the levels to which these people will go. Yeah. Uh, all right, Jordan, before we have to go, make sure, tell everyone where they can find you. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. You can go to dossier.substack.com and, and find all of my good written work there. Yeah, uh, and thank you again for all of the good work that you are doing. It is so crucial right now, uh, especially. So thank you so much, Jordan, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, all right, before we come back, we want to thank our sponsor, Birch Gold Group. So Ronald Reagan saw it like 40 years ago, massive inflation that uh, previously we hadn't seen since until the Biden administration entered. In his own words, uh, inflation is as violent as a mugger, as frightening as an armed robber, and as deadly as a hitman, Reagan said. Now, right now, your retirement accounts are under attack thanks to the inflationary policies of this administration. So I'm telling you guys, you cannot wait to call Birch Gold. They are the best people to, to help you diversify your 401ks, IRAs into gold. Uh, again, don't wait until you are too late. You're gonna miss out, you're gonna lose money. Don't drown. Birch Gold has your life vest, all right? They've got thousands of satisfied customers, an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. You can trust them to protect your savings. Text the word Y to the number 989898. You'll get a no-cost, no-obligation information kit. It's like a 20-page guide. It will tell you how you can protect your savings with gold and silver, and also how you can buy them under the umbrella of a tax-sheltered account, all right? There's no obligation, like I said, but you don't want to miss out. Don't wait until it's too late. You see what the Biden administration is doing to the economy. Text the word Y to 989898. Nine eight nine eight. That is why to nine eight nine eight nine eight. Uh, going along with the conversation that uh, James and I just had with Jordan, by the way, welcome to Yaku Buyans. I just appeared. Host of The Bottom Line and, <laughs> uh, uh, of course, Belize TV contributor. Thanks for, for joining us. Okay. And I, I had a feeling that you would want to be present for this particular conversation going along with the conversation we were having with Jordan on what is really going on with these vaccines that they claim that there is FDA approval, uh, but really the ones that have been FDA approved are not available in the United States. Um, of course, there is a report that has surfaced that the Biden administration is pushing the FDA uh, to uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, to request emergency use authorization to the FDA for a vaccine uh, for children. <laughs> Just as young as six months. So, you know, they, because they, ha they haven't injected the little ones yet. They've gotten all the way down to the five year olds, and that wasn't enough for them. And, you know, it's just interesting because you see them doing this, and they keep request, they have to request it under emergency use, emergency use authorization. And you look at the numbers, and you're like, how in the hell have they been able to acquire EUAs? For children, when you look at the numbers, as statistically, it's like the, zero that children are going to die from this, especially when you look at six months to five years old. And still, you have the Biden administration pushing for the FDA to approve under the EUA for children as young as six months to get the COVID-19 vaccine. What the hell kind of world am I living in, James? A corrupt one. <laughs> The corrupt one. That's the only possible answer to this. There's no scientific justification whatsoever. And uh, there's some kind of an agenda to get that injection into literally everybody, including <laughs> children, uh, that's being, you know, pushed. Of course, children being unlike adults, adults can really put up a fight and say no. A lot of six months old aren't going to be very successful right. in making the argument against uh, <laughs> against their forced vaccination. But the only possible answer, what kind of world is this, is a corrupt one. Mm -hmm. There's, it's the only word that possibly fits. Yeah. You know, okay. nothing, nothing on earth is new. The Bible teaches us that. Politics runs in cycles. There's the same party now talking about vaccinating a six-month-old under emergency use. What's the emergency? There is no emergency. Mm -hmm. Zero. Wind the clock back to 1950. The same party. Take a scientist, the Fauci of the day named Alfred Kinsey. Kinsey goes and does sexual experiments on six months olds, mm. six week olds, okay? This is their MO. It's the same as it's always been. This is the party that want to eradicate and erase certain sectors of society. This is the party that targets the blacks community. This is the, the party that allows Margaret you know, Sanger, Planned Parenthood to do what they do. So I'm not surprised that they're saying six months old. I, I think I said it, they'll go in vitro yeah. if they can. They won't stop because they are the party of death and destruction to what we know as America today. And the only way do you do it is you've got to fundamentally alter the future generations. And that's what they're doing at reckless abandon. They don't care about human life one iota. 
So do you guys think it's, I mean, I often ask myself, I feel like it can be about two forms of control, right? Number one, about the obvious control mechanism of requiring every, you must get vaccinated or else. But I also wonder if it's about having no control group, right? Like why, yeah. why, why else would you mm. try to force all of these children mm. who, as we can see, it's, it's not going to be a, a, a big deal for them. You know, I have people who are like, oh yeah, as if it's a something new for children to get vaccinated. And it's like, Okay, if you want to make the argument that you're worried about polio or all of these other things, that's a separate conversation because this is uh, a virus that is actually, it's uniquely not dangerous to children. So it's just bizarre to me that people use that analogy, but it really feels a lot like they don't want a control group at all. I think they don't. Um, they've got also, you know, another dimension to this is there's almost a religious fervor mm -hmm. that we might call zero COVID or yeah. COVID zero faith or something like this. And the goal is, you know, that they, they still are clinging to this belief that they've used to construct all the tyranny that they've built off of this, that if we do the, the right things X, Y, and Z, then we can get to zero COVID. We can eradicate COVID from the planet. And what this means then is they have to keep taking grander and grander and grander steps to prove just how committed they are to this, you know, sinking ship. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's even grander than, than injecting five-year-olds? Well, right. injecting six-months-olds is even grander. So it's just showing that, that they're so committed to this failed policy of zero COVID that was never realistic. Mm -hmm. No matter what the circumstances of the virus, whether they're trying to cover their own butts or whatever it is, it was never realistic. And it's, an, it's a catastrophe unfolding. But if they keep bringing it down to younger people, they're going to be able to keep saying, you know, this is how committed we are to it. This is how we still really believe that if we all just do the right thing and everybody does their part and sacrifices their kids now to it, then we can get to zero COVID. Yeah, I think James is right. It really is. James is right. And your question is the real question. That's the bottom line question, not to plug a show, but that's the question is, <laughs> where's the control group? Yeah. Where's the proof? And are, uh, do they even show you that they are remotely interested? When they, when they had the opportunity to some bring you facts, they go, it's going to take us 57 years to bring you the truth. It, it, they have no interest because it's not about that. There's a different agenda. There's a different MO. It's evil to the core. And, and look, um, hopefully America will wake up. This is a cult. This is what a cult looks like. You move as a unit as sheep. Regardless, this, I don't know if you've ever seen this study. It's, it's, it's called the ash study. You have mice running into a pipe, falling into water. But there's food sprinkled all around the pipe and they just follow each other and they just dive into the water, right? And this is the issue. They will take us off the cliff mm -hmm. because they've got an ammo and we are the expendables. We are the ones that ultimately, you know, it's, it's a means to an end. So, Sarah, that's the question is, is, OK, show me that you at least are interested in having a controlled study for those who are free willingly say, yeah, vaccinate me. I'll be the lab rat, right? Not interested at all, whatsoever. Yeah. You know, you guys mentioned the this being a religion and a cult. Uh, might I just share with you Jake Tapper over at CNN, who uh, <laughs> is very frustrated these days that uh, people are saying things, crazy outlandish things. You, you got, we're all conspiracy theorists here who say these ridiculous things like schools should be open and like children shouldn't wear masks at schools. I mean, that's, that's very frustrating for Jake Tapper to hear, watch. One of the things that, that I look at this show has been talking about the need to open schools since the summer of 2020. Right. Uh, so I'm not against that. And, and we've been talking because we've been following the science. Right. And that's what the science mm. has been saying. One of the things that's a little bit frustrating is people demanding schools be open, people demanding that uh, students don't have to wear masks without acknowledging that most kids are still not vaccinated. If you want to, it seems to me you want to open the schools as safely as possible you know, all the kids and teachers and faculty and staff need to be vaccinated. That's the safest thing to do, right? Right. You can't have it both ways. You can't not vaccinate your kids and also want your kids to go to school completely un unencumbered. Yes, you can. Uh, no, I think that that's totally fine, especially since if we're talking about protecting the staff, you mentioned the staff, the teachers and the faculty, they've had the opportunity to get vaccinated for a while now. So if the vaccine works, keep coming back to that. If the vaccine works, the adults 
who might be uh, more prone to negative consequences from this particular virus would be protected and have nothing to worry about. Am I right? So they follow the science. They said so. <laughs> That's true. You're, shoot, you're right, James. They did say they followed the, the science. Well, like, look at the other science that they've been following, seeing as, you know, mentioning that they don't care one iota about human life or children. You know, the science has suddenly discovered that it's always been normal for kids to have, you know, heart attacks and strokes. <laughs> right. Like, all of a sudden, right. after they start vaccinating children, it's been always been normal. The science says so. The science is in the little known causes. And so the science Science, of course, is just as pretense to whatever. It's like this thing they evoke, in, evo, invoke. It's this thing they invoke, like you know, a talisman or like a like a like a deity yep. or whatever. They, yep. you know, yeah. Ball, aka Science, has come into the room and says, you know, we're going to vaccinate. We follow the science because we have to protect the adults at the cost of the children. Right, <laughs> which has never been the case. Like, that's that's, not if that's what, what our teachers do. believe, do we want them around children? Right, exactly. Yeah. Like, come here, little human shields, protect teacher. Yeah, was, I'm uh, pretty sure it's supposed to be the opposite. Everybody, go to social media and, and tweet this out and do it. Jake Tapper, come on this show with me <laughs> in July. Come on this come show. Have some, have, some, have some kahunas and come on a show, okay? I'll say this to you. That whole circus show makes me think of Jerry Maguire. When Cuba Gooding Jr. and Jerry stand in the bathroom, he goes, show me the money. Show me the facts. Show me the facts yeah. that children are in danger. You've got nothing. Goose egg. Yeah. Uh, all right, we've got more to come. In case you weren't frustrated enough, We've got more to come, but first we want to thank our sponsor, Home Title Lock. So, uh, look, you put all of this equity in your homes. It'd be devastating if you had a criminal come in and steal all of that equity that usually oftentimes is your retirement nest egg. Well, this crime is happening all over the country right now. There is one company that is standing between you and these thieves. That is Home Title Lock. The FBI actually calls home title fraud one of the fastest growing crimes. Uh, you need to go to HomeTitleLock.com. They are America's leader in home title protection. And so here's what happens. The deed to your home is the only document that proves that you own it, right? But everything is online now. So in minutes, a criminal can go pull your home's the deed. Uh, they can forge your name off of it to your home, the deed to your home, and refile as the new owner. And then they can take out loans against your equity. They can sell your home right out from under you. Just trust me. You don't want this to happen to you. And your banking system, they, they don't have a program for this. Identity theft programs, they don't have something that covers this. Home Title Lock does, all right? You got to go to HomeTitleLock.com. They will give you peace of mind that the deed to your home is protected. That is HomeTitleLock.com, HomeTitleLock.com. Uh, all right, everyone, make sure that you've taken your blood pressure medication for this one. A new working paper from Johns Hopkins University's Studies in Applied Economics uh, Institute claims that COVID-19 lockdowns imposed by a variety of governments worldwide had, quote, little to no effect, end quote, on COVID-19 mortality. Again, this was a, a study that uh, it was like three professors who were located all around the world. They looked at worldwide lockdowns. And uh, they said, also, shockingly, you guys are going to be shocked to hear that lockdowns, they said, imposed enormous economic and social costs and are, quote, ill-founded and should be rejected as a pandemic policy instrument. So they, more specifically, they found that uh, lockdowns in Europe and the United States only reduced COVID-19 mortality by 0.2% on average. And by the way, this is like, I, I don't believe that this is including all of the deaths that the lockdowns actually created. Yep. Um, so you, you would see those numbers definitely change if you were factoring those numbers in. You know, it's just really frustrating because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a professor associated with Johns Hopkins University. And yet, and yet, I had the common sense in March of 2020 to talk on this show Every single day, by the way, while everyone else was, you know, had to be shut down and, you know, forced to wear face diapers all over their faces, even here in Texas, we came here every day on this program and told people this was a bad idea and it would lead to more deaths and more destruction and uh, more economic problems than just allowing a virus to make its way through society would and, and protecting the vulnerable yes. would do. And here we are in hindsight in 2022, we have to have Johns Hopkins uh, tell us something that like anyone with an ounce of common sense would already have known? <laughs> we follow the science here, don't we? <laughs> 
that's it's, a cut. You keep going back well, to that. You have to follow the science, and the science the science wasn't in. I mean, it clearly was, but right. now it's really in. We see what what zero point two percent. What is that? One out of five hundred. Yeah. Or something like that is the difference that it that it allegedly made. I'm sure it made you know differences in different places, like locking people down in say New York in a in a nursing home probably. Uh, skewed those numbers a little bit, so it's. But it, you're right. It's. It was quite clear very early on, and for for myself, you know, I started collecting data by about April of 2020, looking at it, and I said, okay, some of these states are kind of opening up, they're easing restrictions. Some other states are staying stricter. Let's just see what the yeah. what the growth rate looks like in the different states. And I just started collecting a database and started running a very simple model and uh, analyzing that. And it's like, oh wow, the states that are opening up are actually, besides the economic effects, which are obvious, mm -hmm. uh, everybody should have thought they were obvious, except I guess the laptop class. Uh, <laughs> but for everybody else, it's obvious. But besides that, I was like, wow, the states that are opening up are actually doing slightly better where, you know, common sense, according to the model, would be that they're going to be, you know, summers of death and destruction. Mm -hmm. And so anybody looking at the data, honestly, even by early in 2020, early in the pandemic, would have been able to see that, you, you know, I, I don't think two weeks to flatten the curve was a good idea or real. Right. Right. But, OK, you did your two-week experiment. You already have some data. It didn't work. It isn't going to work in abandoned ship. But no, instead, what you see, again, is doubling down, doubling down, doubling down uh, by the people who so-called follow the science. Yeah, There's, to be fair, we are only like 650 days into two weeks to flatten the curve. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'd love to see this comparison juxtaposed, right? So 0.2% reduced mortality rate. Juxtapose that with suicide rate going through yep. the roof, yep. with economic destruction, families falling, domestic violence, yep. trafficking. Let's take all those numbers and give me a beautiful JP Morgan model and run it head to head. And you're going to see that the lockdown is the worst thing you could ever do to a society. Having one size fits all, unilaterally force people to disengage as human beings, which is what we're designed for. This, mm -hmm. not Zoom. No. This. Yeah. Okay, not classroom, kids. All right, and let's run that number and get the real number to see. And, and then all of a sudden, what I want to see in this country right now, and I'll start it, heck, I want to see a class action suit by all the families that lost family members through suicide, economic destruction, losing their business, losing their homes against the federal government. A massive nationwide class action suit saying, we're pointing to your science. Mm -hmm. CDC saying you cost us this yeah. That's right. by, by mitigating a 0.2% risk, which is arguable, by the way. Which is arguable, Okay, yeah. Because the cases by death, I have a friend, motorcycle accident, death by COVID. Right. Excuse me, yeah. hit a pole at 90 miles an hour, okay? That's not death by COVID, happened to have COVID on my motorcycle. Mm -hmm. So that 0.2%, I even question that. Yeah. Yeah. Give them grace and say 10% of that. So 0.02%, right? Yeah. So let's throw a class, let's make it the largest lawsuit in history and go after the federal government and just, you know, absolutely decimate them for what they've done to the world, by the way. Yeah. Because so goes America. The world followed us. Yeah, it, yep. it, it is really interesting, you know, Yaku, you mentioned the uh, dying from COVID versus with COVID. And it's interesting to watch these people in real time try to backtrack without backtracking. So we're seeing them now within the last couple of weeks come out and say, uh, oh, by the way, we, we definitely want to make a distinction uh, in yeah. that, you know, we, sh we probably should be counting these numbers. And it's like, oh, what the, think of the names that we were called for insinuating that you guys were miscounting all of these numbers before. Now, all of a sudden, you think that we should be uh, separately categorizing these. Interesting, again, in hindsight. But, James, I know you'll say they're just following the science. They are following the science <laughs> is what it is. What, what, what we're seeing here, though, is, is that these people can't be trusted with anything anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with this this particular number, we, we, we did all this lockdown, all this damage, unquestionable damage, uh, unbelievable damage. To mitigate, let's take them at their 0.2%, one out of 500 or de whatever deaths. And so we did all of this. And what we see there is a failure. of what, They've collapsed everything into one variable as only one variable matters. Like in the schools, it's, are the children vaccinated or not? Only one variable matters. Yeah. All of a sudden, you know, with COVID, it's, you know, 
what are the hospitalizations? Everything gets collapsed onto one variable that is the one that they get to propagandize with. And we see this failure again and again and again. And we're seeing it from people who are hyper competent in their fields to the point where we can no longer think that this is ignorance, mm -hmm. that this is just people making a mistake. This is, this is intentional. This is malicious. This is, you can't screw this up this badly, this consistently, without it being on purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really well said and uh, unfortunately, <laughs> actually very true. Uh, all right, we've got to take a break. First, we want to thank our sponsor, mygotodoc.com. So, you know, we're having all of these conversations uh, about you can't trust the government with your health. All right. So you may be thinking, where can I find uh, some sort of a, a, a healthcare expert, a doctor online that I can trust, maybe who's a COVID expert, not just a prescription factory. And uh, maybe where can I find a pharmacy that will actually dispense off-label medication that's not going to charge me an arm and a leg? The answer to all of those questions is, of course, mygotodoc.com. Uh, look, I think that the pandemic is going to play itself out very soon, but I know that a lot of you who have had a really hard time uh, finding the prescriptions that you need, whether it be finding a doctor who will pr prescribe the right treatment if you get hit with Omicron or Delta or whatever you get hit with, uh, and also hard to find a pharmacy who will actually give you the medication that your doctor is prescribing to you. You've got to try mygotodoc.com, all right? Dr. Saeed Hader has really built something there uh, that you really need to know about for three reasons. Number one, he's a COVID expert. He's treated over 40,000 patients with zero deaths. Number two, you can register for free and ask questions, as many as you as you need, and they will connect you to pharmacies that ship you a full 28 doses of ivermectin for less than $150. Now, I want to tell you guys very, very quickly, uh, we had someone who reached out to Steve Dace, one of our hosts on the network, and Steve reached out to uh, one of our, our sales people, and she got in touch with the doctor directly. The doctor got in touch with this woman. She was having a very rough go of it. She didn't have anyone who would prescribe her the right dosage of ivermectin, and now she is doing much, much better since she got in touch with this doctor. He really he really is out there trying to, trying to help with all of this. I very, very highly encourage you to go there today. It is mygotodoc.com. Make sure you have it for when you need it, mygotodoc.com. Uh, James, I think this uh, this next story is going to tie in just perfectly with your book that you have out. But the uh, Anti-Defamation League has, uh, <laughs> they're in a little bit of hot water right now because they have changed the definition of racism on their website. So previously it was, of course, racism is the belief that a particular race is superior or inferior to another uh, you know, a person's, a person's social and moral traits are predetermined by his or her inborn biological characteristics. And, uh, you know, if you think that different races should remain segregated, that you're probably pretty racist. And then now let's go to this new one. Racism is now the marginalization and or oppression of people of color based on a socially constructed racial hierarchy that privileges white people. So if you are a person of color, you obviously cannot be racist. No, this is straight critical race theory. Welcome to race Marxism, as the title of the book goes. Um, so the this isn't easy to explain, you know, in this kind of a simple brief thing. But basically what the critical race theorists have done is reinvented Marx's conflict across the 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 bourgeoisie, the capitalists, and the proletariat, the working class. So they, he said that those are intrinsically in conflict with one another, but what a lot of people don't understand is that Marx said that the bourgeoisie, the capitalist people, create all these ideas called ideology that justify why they get to be in charge, why they get to be lawyers, why they get to run the factories, they worked for it, meritocracy, etc. They cook up all of these ideological claims for why they get to be in charge, and then that everybody else gets to be oppressed by them because they didn't work as hard, or they didn't do it right, or they didn't get educated, or whatever. And Marx has this whole belief that what happens is that the, the conflict between those, the conflict between those creates a structure for society, a, a, an entire structural system that, that shapes how society works, shapes who you are and who you can become, the contents of your character are forged by this, and this gets reproduced exactly in critical race theory. In critical race theory, they say that there's this property that you can hold called whiteness. There's a paper, whiteness as property. That's the title of the paper from 93 by Cheryl Harris. People who hold that property of, of whiteness have an ideology called white supremacy that justifies why they get to be property holders. 
the people of color versus these people who have access to whiteness creates a structural system that conditions how everybody's lives are lived, et cetera. And so what you see is that the ADL has actually moved into the critical race theory definition, the race Marxist definition of racism, which rather ironically given it's the ADL, really reproduces the exact same kind of mentality that made national socialism so dangerous. Mm -hmm. Specifically, there's a lot of problems. Here's this racial group that we're gonna scapegoat as the cause of all of our problems. Whiteness gets scapegoated, or people who have access to whiteness are scapegoated through this definition of critical race theory. Yeah, golly, Yako. The, the amount of rage <laughs> in my body. I, I, I can imagine, yeah. I'm telling you, I should not comment, because I am, <laughs> I'm telling you, I am, this is who, can the Jewish community in this nation for once wake the heck up? Wake up and step up and call things for what it is. The most persecuted people in the history of the planet. Not just the Holocaust. Back to freaking Moses and Pharaoh and, and you know, Saul for crying out loud. Can we just step up for once and get out of your political ideology and, and your wokeness and let right be right and wrong be wrong. We, this is a slippery. I do not subscribe to that absolute horse crap. This is so detrimental to culture. It will break culture in a way you cannot return. You want to go see it, a little country called South Africa. You look at reverse racism where there's genocidal killing on white farmers by blacks. You cannot look at that condition and not go, it's hate-driven towards a specific race, and it's a fact. It's, it's wrong. It's wrong if it's black on white, white on black, Hispanic, Middle East, it doesn't matter. It's one human being from a race looking at another human being in a heart issue and go, you're less than me because of the color of your skin, where you're from, where you were born, your economic status, whatever. It is what it is. And this is so dangerous, and I've said it before, you cannot change culture without changing language. Mm -hmm. They're reshaping language. If you subscribe to it, shame on you. If you buy into it and you want to virtue signal as uh, some woke white folk and you want to just virtue signal with CRT, shame on you. You're breaking the planet. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I, I would really encourage the folks at the ADL, although I don't think they will, but people who maybe are Jewish that care about what the ADL mm -hmm. says and does should probably go take a look at this. There is a book from 1998 in critical race theory called How Jews Became White Folks. And if you read wow. this book, if you read this book, it's extraordinary. It talks about how they threw black people under the bus in the 1950s so that they could become classified as white, so that then they could rise up to the top of white culture and be the cultural trendsetters for whiteness, which is, <laughs> this is a perfect reproduction of the exact same kind of scapegoating that the ADL is supposed to exist to prevent. Mm. And How Jews Became White Folks is the title of a book in critical race theory. So I don't understand how there's anybody who supports this. And then this definition is in perfect line with that that the ADL's taken up. Yeah. Uh, all right, we've got we've to take a, a quick break. We'll be right back. Godly. They're so disgusting. That is incredible. Hey, don't forget, uh, before you go, remember, you got to go over to where you get your audio podcast. We know that you like watching our smiling faces, but go over to where you get your audio podcast, subscribe, rate, and review the news and why it matters. Uh, they're not kind to conservatives in the algorithm. You know this. This will help more people be able to find the show. And as an added bonus, you may see a review read live on air like the one today from uh, STL Kimberly. I assume that's St. Louis, STL Kimberly, five stars. Sarah is sarcastically wonderful. That's very sweet. In this insane world, Sarah sarcasm to the news of the day is very entertaining. She's awesome. I appreciate that. I just don't want you guys jumping off of a bridge, which is I feel like what you would want to do if you had to sit there and watch Ryan Stelter every night or something. So we're, we're, just, we're, just, we're just here for you, okay? Uh, also one from Rob T. Dog, who says five stars, the news and why it's important. God bless, so much information, and definitely fun show, amazing people always. We appreciate it, you guys. Make sure you get your reviews in, and you may see it on air. I mean, if you say something nice about one of us, we'll definitely put it on. Right. But uh, also don't forget, James, tell everyone really quickly where they can find your book. On the Amazon.com. We're publishing it through my company, which is called New Discourses. So at first it'll be on Amazon and Amazon only. It'll eventually be in bookstores everywhere. 
Awesome. Well, uh, we really appreciate the work that you're doing because it is so crucial. Uh, I mean, there's an entire lot of us who are getting persecuted and no one's talking about it, but James is talking about it. Uh, also, don't forget to follow Jakub Uyans, host of The Bottom Line, Blaze TV contributor. Thank you guys so much. This has been great.